Hey, my name is Ron Carrico. I'm with the San Diego Air and Space Museum. Today is the 30th. How about the 30th of May, <laughs> uh, 2013, and we're interviewing today Maury Rosenberg. And Maury was a, an Air Force pilot. He was in the service for 22 years. 22 and a half years. 22 and a half years, and he was uh, flew in the SR-71 Blackbird, and he also flew F-4s, and. Uh, I graduated from pilot training in uh, 1966. And uh, after pilot training, where did you go? Uh, I went to Tucson, Arizona to Davis Mothman for uh, F-4 training. I had an assignment to uh, Vietnam. And uh, you were in Vietnam. How many, how many uh, missions did you fly in Vietnam? I flew 260 missions in uh, Vietnam. And after that, you came back to the States, did you? No. From Vietnam, I had a consecutive overseas assignment. I went to Yokota Air Base in Japan. And after Yokota Air Base, where did you go? I went to uh, the, I was an instructor at the uh, Fighter Weapons School at Nellis Air Force Base in Nevada. So still in the F-4? Still in the F-4. Okay, so when you were at Nellis Air Force Base, somehow you got involved in the SR-71 program, is that correct? That's correct. Um, I volunteered for the SR-71 program. How did, how did you do that, by the way? It was an all-volunteer program, um, and you would uh, contact uh, someone at Beale Air Force Base if you were interested in the program and they'd tell you the procedure for uh, submitting some uh, resume about yourself and then also they would pull your uh, military records and review them and, and uh, then if they were interested in you they would call you up to come out to Beale for a uh, interview it was a week-long process uh, initially how, that's how they ran it it changed a little later on in the program the interview process so you apparently passed and uh when did you start flying in the SR-71? I started flying the SR-71 in uh, 1973. I think it was around probably uh, June, May or June of 73. And you actually flew it twice, is that correct? That's correct. I had two tours in the SR-71. The first one was from uh, May of 73, uh, I believe. I reported in April and flew the SR-71 until July of 1978. And I had a break in service. I was out of the uh, Air Force for a little over two years. And then I went back on active duty, and I was sent right back to the SR-71 where I flew it for another four years from uh, December of 80 to uh, August of 84. So how many hours did you end up flying the SR-71? I had uh, 1,000 and, um, I think it was 1,096 hours in the SR-71. And according to my records, uh, I have the most operational hours in the SR-71. There are some other individuals, uh, pilots, and uh, RSOs or radar uh, reconnaissance systems officers that have over a thousand hours. Now, what is an operations? What does that mean, operations? The reconnaissance systems operation or operator. He was uh, generally a, a navigator. A lot of them were uh, B-52 radar navs. Uh, they had a navigator background. Some of them flew F-111s, and the gentleman in the back seat, the officer in the back seat, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, he did not have any flight controls or flight instruments. You couldn't fly the airplane from the back, back seat. It was considered a two-person single pilot aircraft. Uh, but he ran all the uh, electronic gear, all the uh, cameras. He ran the astro inertial navigation system, and he would uh, do some of the radio uh, conversations or talking. So now, what, when you say operational missions, what, are, what does that mean as opposed to just flying around the traffic pattern? Uh, there were training sorties that flew uh, within the United States, and then operational missions, all missions that were operational were uh, came through SAC headquarters, but they were actually uh, uh, initiated at uh, the Joint, uh, the Pentagon through the JCS, the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And SAC stands for? Uh, Strategic Air Command. So they had a kind of a reconnaissance wing of the Strategic Air Command? That's correct. The uh, ninth uh, SRS was the ninth Strategic Reconnaissance Wing at Beale Air Force Base, and the first SRS was the first Strategic Reconnaissance Squadron. And isn't the ninth like one of the oldest Air Force squadrons? Um, yes. I'm trying to remember if it's actually the ninth or if it's the first SRS was a World War I squadron. Wow. Well, anyway, we're here to talk about actually how you actually fly an SR-71. So first of all, why don't you give us some parameters of the, of the performance, like time to climb, how fast it would go, how high it flew. Okay, um, I believe just about everything that I'm aware of, uh, other than maybe some of the defensive gear or the navigation gear, is declassified. Uh, but it would uh, cruise routinely 
uh, leveling off at about 75,000 feet, uh, depending on weight, and it would have, fly a cruise climb, and it would uh, generally start a descent somewhere in the neighborhood of 83 to 85,000 feet. Uh, <clears throat> the aircraft was capable of flying uh, a little over uh, 85,000 feet, maybe 87, 88,000 feet. And the speed? Speed-wise, uh, we cruised routinely at Mach uh, 3.0 to Mach 3.3. And, and it had a dash capability of Mach 3.5. What uh, uh, in miles per? Let's see. What in miles per hour that would be? 3.3 cruise speed would be a little over 2,200 miles per hour. Okay. Now, actually, the SR-71 holds a closed course speed record, correct? That's right. And that was flown in what year was that? Um, I don't remember the exact year, but I want to say it was uh, in the neighborhood of about 1976. And you were you were involved in that, right? I was. I flew uh, the. Uh, they tried to involve the pilots in everything when there was something of, uh, you know, <clears throat> special credibility to the uh, unit and to the crews, and uh, the aircraft they used for flying the uh, speed and altitude records. I got to fly, uh, I was still considered a junior pilot at the time in the squadron, and I got to fly the, uh, all the test parameters prior to the pilots that were going to fly the actual test. And um, the speed record, I believe, uh, that uh, they achieved was about 2,196 miles per hour, something like that. And on the test flight, I took it out to, to its max speed where the aircraft sometimes has what they call an aerodynamic disturbance or an unstart. Uh, where the inlet quits uh, running for any various particular reasons. And uh, I had it out to about uh, a little over 2,200 miles per hour when it had an unstart. And so we defined that we weren't going to try and go over 2,200 when the actual uh, pilot that was uh, uh, designated to fly the test was going to fly it. Where was it? The, the test? Yes. Uh, they flew, uh, it was over California, uh, down by the Edwards Ranges, I believe. And uh, it was uh, has to be sanctioned by the um, I can't think of the international ICAO or something, but the uh, the French. I don't know what it is. <laughs> I don't remember off the top of my head. So how big was the course? Uh, I don't remember exactly. I want to say it was a maybe a five-kilometer course. Let's take, okay, so it, let's get some parameters for the performance. So if if you're at eighty thousand feet, and you're going to make a hundred and eighty degree turn. You're going to turn around 180 degrees and go back the other way. And you started over downtown Los Angeles and turn left. Where would you roll out? <clears throat> to do a 180 degree turn, um, uh, approximately, I'm trying to think, probably out towards uh, Redlands. It was about uh, 69 miles, 70 miles. Okay, so if you were flying due south, if you are flying due west, so you'd roll out somewhere near San Diego then? Yeah, if you, yeah true. Okay. All right, so let's talk about uh, time to climb. To get to that altitude of your initial, well, first of all, that's, that's not how you did it. No, you would we, would, we would take off. And? And after takeoff, we normally took off with a about a, a fourth of the fuel load. And that was uh, for less wear and tear on the aircraft, number one, uh, and uh, less wear and tear on the, the brakes, the airframe, et cetera. And it also uh, increased your capabilities if you had an engine failure. It uh, gave you a greater speed that you could cope with an engine failure and safely get the airplane airborne to come back around and land. So, so you heavy weight. So a typical profile would be take off and then you would meet a tanker. Correct. We would take off normally out of Beale and we would climb unrestricted to about 20 to 25,000 feet. We'd accelerate to, uh, we flew uh, knots equivalent airspeed or keys and we would take off and accelerate to uh, 400 knots until we picked up 0.9 Mach. When we were subsonic, we generally always flew 0.9 Mach. And uh, then you would cruise to a tanker. You would uh, refuel, depending on if it was operational or a training sortie, depending on how much fuel you would take off or take on, excuse me. But normally, you would take on anywhere from 50 to 70,000 pounds of fuel. And maximum fuel load was? So just out of curiosity, when you're at altitude and doing Mach 2.2 at 80,000 feet or so, what would be your keys? Uh, I have to think about that a second. Your keys would, at Mach uh, 3.2 or so at 80,000 feet, your keys would probably be in the neighborhood of about 300 and, uh, 
I want to say somewhere close to 350, 370. So there was quite a bit of different, quite a bit of a range of speed between the speed you were going and a stall speed. Yes. Okay. I understand the U2, it's pretty darn close. That's correct. Point. Yeah. Okay. So you had, now if you're at point 3.3.3 point, 3 .3, and you're at 85,000 feet and you're low on fuel, you've got so much energy, can't you just pull a stick back and zoom the thing to another five to 10,000 feet? Not really, no. <laughs> it would become uh, pitch sensitive in a turn and you could stall it out pretty easy oh, really? when you got too slow. What bank of turn would you use in, in, in typically at, at, in your in missions? The missions were programmed for different banks of turn depending on the mission, but normally it was about a 30 degree bank. Uh, we flew missions uh, in the Baltic out of uh, Mildenhall, RAF Mildenhall in England, and we would uh, program those for uh, uh, actually 42 degrees of bank, but because of speed parameters and sometimes temperature changes, which would affect the turn radius because it would affect the speed, there was a buffer of about three degrees. So uh, you could go up to 45 degrees a bank. So they planned the, tur the turns at about 42 to 42 and a half, but then you had a buffer if the aircraft was starting to slide outside of the turn for whatever reason, you could go up to 45 degrees a bank. How would you know? Um, normally when you were in what they called uh, the take portion of a mission, then you would turn the uh, lateral navigation on to autopilot. You always had that running in autopilot when you were taking uh, either pictures, radar pictures, or uh, like what you would consider now digital type pictures um, <clears throat> for more stability. Uh, you were basically always hand flying the pitch. You, uh, the, the, the pitch was basically always hand flown. The autopilot was capable of flying the pitch, but sometimes it would get erratic with uh, temperature changes. So I, I think the, the lesson here is that uh, there were not any ham-handed pilots flying SR-71s. <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> Very gentle on the controls. Okay, let's let's go back to the the actual procedure of flight. That's what we wanted to talk about. <clears throat> uh, let's talk about first of all from takeoff. Let's say you're going to take off at seven o'clock in the morning. What time do you show up? Well, first of all. Um, you would uh, mission plan the day before. You'd mission plan 24 hours in advance. Uh, even for an operational mission, JCS usually gave us 24 hours notice. The shortest notice I can ever recall getting was about uh, somewhere around 14 hours of notice. And, and any uh, particular reason on that particular mission? Uh, yes. <laughs> the, that particular mission was um, a scheduled, originally started off as a scheduled mission out of RAF Mildenhall to go up to the Barents. Uh, for uh, keeping track of the uh, sub submarines, the Russian submarines, and the subpens in, in the Barents, which the uh, uh, CNO, Chief of Naval Operations, was briefed on every daily, I assume. And they had uh, satellites and other means of uh, knowing where all the Russian subs were. And we're talking about um, 19, uh, this was about 1981, maybe, 1982. And the satellites were down. They had a satellite down, the weather was bad, and they had scheduled an SR-71 out of Mildenhall. And the SR-71 took off out of Mildenhall and lost an engine. So the aircraft was a high maintenance aircraft. Uh, in other words, if it had an engine problem and they landed and they had to change an engine or fix an engine, it was gonna take anywhere from 14, 15, 20, 25 hours of uh, maintenance and then maybe require a test stop. So anyhow, um, when they told the CNO what the problem was, he said, well, you have two airplanes there, launch the other airplane. The other airplane was in, was in maintenance. It was actually broken, which he, nobody had ever told him. So then the next thing the CNO said was, you have airplanes at Beale Air Force Base. Why can't you launch one from there? So that's what they ended up doing. I was at the squadron. It was about, um, at Beale Air Force Base, I was at the squadron. It was about 9.30, 10 o'clock in the morning when I got a, uh, a call from uh, the command post. And they said, uh, go home and go to bed, be back at midnight. And so we knew that something was going on. So that's at 10 in the morning. So uh, we came back actually about 11 o'clock at night and we actually did our mission planning then. We launched out of Beale about, I wanna say, somewhere between two and three in the morning. And we flew from Beale uh, all the way to the Barents refuel, with refuelings en route and uh, did our take 
in the Barrens, and then we recovered in Mildenhall, and they had a dedicated uh, aircraft to take the uh, all the uh, radar and any other photography to Washington, D.C., directly there uh, to be processed and briefed to the uh, CNO, Chief of Naval Operations. How many miles was that total? Probably about, uh, I'm guessing, total, I'm, I'm guessing probably about eight to 10,000 miles. And how many hours? It was um, about a seven hour sortie. <laughs> Jeez. Okay, so let's uh, talk about pick, typical, all right. So if you're going to take off at seven, it's just a regular mission. You've already pre-fly, uh, you've ever done anything. You didn't actually pre-flight the airplanes ever, right? That's correct. You always, there was always a buddy crew, and the buddy crew would pre-flight the aircraft. So you arrive, now you're going to get suited up. That's the point I'm getting at, is you, you've got to get right, suited right, up in your spacesuit. Right. Normally, uh, let's just do a typical training mission. Okay. A training mission, you would, as I said, uh, mission plan the day before. You'd show up at base operations two hours before takeoff. So if takeoff was at 9 in the morning, you'd be at uh, base operations at 7. You'd go over your weather. And uh, then from base operations, you would go to the physiological support division, or PSD, that maintained the pressure suits and were in charge of the ejection seats and all the emergency equipment that went with the ejection seats. Um, and uh, when you got to PSD, you would have uh, uh, a meal, which was considered a high-protein, low-residue meal, usually consisted of some sort of protein with eggs, which normally could be steak, possibly, or um, um, ham, or something like that. And um, <clears throat> while you were having breakfast, the crew chief would come in with the uh, uh, flight manual or the uh, airplane log, and he'd go over everything with you as far as any uh, mechanical things that had been written up or corrected or fixed and so forth. And uh, the buddy crew. Uh, would about this time they would be headed out to do a pre-flight of the uh, aircraft to set all the uh, switches in the cockpit and also do a walk around and check everything underneath the aircraft. Uh, once you had breakfast you would go back into a locker room area where you would change uh, out of your uh, flight suits and we wore long johns under the pressure suit and you would then put on your pressure suit. Um, the PSD crew would help you don the pressure suit or get into it and then they would uh, seal everything up, close everything up, and pressure test your pressure suit and make sure everything was working properly. Once they finished that, um, then you would unlock the baler bar that held the faceplate down, open that up, and uh, everything else would be sealed up as far as your gloves, your boots, etc. cetera. And uh, it would there'd probably be anywhere from a 15 to 20 minute time period there till you would go out to the aircraft. And you would go out to the aircraft uh, about uh, somewhere like 40 to 45 minutes prior to takeoff. And okay, uh, let's talk about the pressure suit for a second. Okay. The, the pressure in the suit, what kind of pressure did it maintain? Well, the pressure suit itself was not inflated when you flew. The cockpit was inflated. So the pressure The cockpit was pressurized, you mean? The cockpit was pressurized, it's, yeah. And you had choice of a couple different pressurizations. Right. You could either fly at 10,000 feet cabin pressure or 25,000 feet. Uh, everyone, 99% of the time, used 25,000 feet. Uh, because you had to have the faceplate closed anyhow. You were breathing 100% oxygen all the time when it was closed. And at 25,000 foot cabin pressure, the air conditioning worked a lot better. Uh, it was hard to get the aircraft cool because of the uh, heat created by friction at speed and altitude. And I think that's a good time to mention the speed, uh, the, the friction. The friction of the air over, passing over the airplane caused a tremendous amount of heat. That's correct. Typically in front, well, let's just give an example. Uh, if you used your glove to touch the windshield, what would happen? In the, uh, the front seat, first of all, uh, <clears throat> if you, if you uh, put your hand on the side of the windscreen, uh, you couldn't hold it there. From that, and you're wearing a pressure suit that has a glove that's a Nomex glove, which is fire retardant. You couldn't hold your hand against the uh, windscreen for more than uh, 30 to maybe 40 seconds at the most because it would be so hot you'd have to take your hand away. So what was this? The temperature? But I think it was in the neighborhood of 600 degrees uh, Celsius. So okay, so now now you you go out the airplane. You're going to start the airplane. How do you start it? What actually starts the airplane? Okay. Do you have a push a button, start a motor type no, thing? No, no, no. You had a uh, initially they used these carts, a start cart that consisted of uh, initially it was two Buick V8 engines that were coupled together. 
and they were hooked up to a spline or whatever you would call it, shaft that would come up into the bottom of the engine and would start turning the turbine. So they would run those uh, uh, Buick engines up and they were extremely loud. It sounded like being at a drag race, if you were at a drag race. And uh, that would uh, start the engine turning. As soon as you saw RPM to start the engine, you would take the throttle out of cutoff and put it in idle. And it took, with a Buick cart start, uh, you should see ignition within, uh, I think it was 15 to 20 seconds. So, so we would turn up to what percent RPM before, I mean, you had to drop something in there. You, fight the, you put a chemical agent in there. Every time you took the throttle out of cutoff, from, from cutoff to idle, or from, uh, 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 what do I want to say, uh, max uh, RPM to afterburner, when you went into afterburner, uh, both of those moves either out of, idle, out of cutoff or into afterburner, you would get a shot of TEB, T-E-B, which is triethyl boron, which is a, um, gosh, I'm trying to think uh, the terminology for it. You know, actually, I have something written down here that will tell you exactly what that is. It's a pyrophoric uh, chemical. It burns with air. It's like phosphorus. It ignites when it hits the air, and that would uh, give you ignition for the uh, Fuel. So coming out of cutoff or going into burner, either one would like would, would put TEB in there. And how many TEBs did you have? There was uh, 16 shots of TEB. <clears throat> per engine. Per engine. And you had a counter at the base of the uh, throttle control panel at the back. And every time you took went in, came out of cutoff to idle or burner, uh, max to burner, um, or military RPM, I should say, to after burner, uh, it would decrease by one. And that was one of the limiting factors was how many shots of tab. So, the RPM's coming up, 15 to 20 percent, boom. 15 to 20 seconds, you should have ignition. Okay. And it's and when it gets ignition, it just winds itself it up. It winds itself up. And which engine do you start first? Uh, we would alternate. Uh, generally, we would start with the uh, left engine. Mm -hmm. And then the next time, they would write it in the logbook, the next time they start the right engine. That's odd. It was just for wear and tear, I think. On, uh, you know, uh, on the, I'm not sure exactly. For okay, the so now hydraulic typ system typically you were in a revetment of some sort. True. And then you taxi out. So now there was always another vehicle with you when you taxied out. Right. And who was that? That was your backup or buddy crew, and they were called uh, mobile. They were they had radios. They could talk to you on uh, UHF or VHF later when we got that. Generally, it was UHF. Okay, so you know, I text you down at the end of the runway. You're cleared out of the runway. Right. One of the interesting questions I heard you ask once before was, when you were on an operational mission, who did you talk to? Uh, generally, once, dep depending on where the operational mission was from, normally... O let's say Okinawa. We, okay, Okinawa. Um, <clears throat> some operational missions, um, they would actually give us a clearance to take the runway and a clearance to take off. Others, they would use a light from the tower, just like World War II. They'd give you a green light to taxi and a green light to take off. So, in essence, uh, s some of the missions, we didn't talk to anybody. <laughs> okay, so you roll out of the runway. You're on the runway. You get your green light wherever you are. You're cleared to take off. Tell us the takeoff procedure. Uh, takeoff procedure was uh, you pull on the runway. You check your headings with your... Uh, ADI and HSI and your uh, whiskey compass uh, and then you would push the power up to uh, military RPM and it, you couldn't it was difficult to lift both throttles into afterburner but you'd try to lift them both into afterburner they never lit together uh, one would light and then the other you'd always get a kick or asymmetric kick so you always were aware of that uh, you'd run them up to military and release the brakes um, then you'd lift the bur uh, throttles into afterburner and you would feel the ignition. It was a little jolt in the aircraft. You'd actually feel it. And uh, once you had it, saw the uh, afterburners were lit, then you'd smoothly move the uh, throttles to max afterburner. And uh, <clears throat> you would start checking your uh, refusal speeds, you know, your lift coming up to your liftoff speed, your single engine, etc. You knew all these ahead of time. Uh, and you would start a smooth rotate with a stick about. Uh, 15 to 25 knots below uh, liftoff speed. And generally speaking, uh, they wanted you to uh, get the nose off the ground by 180 knots because uh, the aircraft would, even, depend, even depending on weight, it would come off the ground at about 210 knots. And the uh, tires 
had a limitation, I think, of about 220, something like that. So you only had, you had a small margin before the tires could overheat if you didn't uh, get the aircraft off the ground. So now, you're, now you get airborne? Raise the gear. And? Accelerate to 400 knots. Start a max climb to 20,000 feet or 25,000 feet. What do you think? From, from was... brake release to 20, 25,000 feet, it'd take about two minutes. Wow. So that climb rate must be, it's a good 10,000? It's 10, maxed at what the uh, BSI is. It's 10 or 11,000 feet per minute. At 10 or 11,000 feet per minute. <clears throat> and going. And we're accelerating all the time <laughs> to 0.9 Mach. Uh, once you lift it off and you put the gear up at 0 0.05 Mach, there was a control between your legs that you would turn and engage, and it was a surface limiter that had to do with the total movement of the rudders. And they only did it early on so you would, wouldn't forget to do it because when you got up to speed and altitude uh, and you had an unstart or a single engine condition and you tried to control the aircraft with the rudders, it limited the uh, amount of surface movement because uh, in certain flight regimes, you could actually rip the rudders off the airplane if you used too much force. So now let's say we're up and we've leveled off. What kind of a, what are the sort of a typical checklist when you've leveled off? Actually, you're just going at the tanker right now, so you're right now. at 25,000, 30,000 feet. Yeah, and, and normally on a training mission, you're talking to air traffic control and all that. Uh, on other sorties, uh, an operational sortie, you're not talking to anybody. You're just flying your route to the, uh, to the tanker. And how do you contact the tanker? Um, we would contact the, the tanker uh, generally on uh, UHF. We'd give them a call. And do you have a typical call sign? Yeah, uh, yeah they had. We all had um, classified call signs, and we talked to each other. So uh, it wasn't like uh, uh, the training sorties for the SR-71B model was Aspen 56. I think that was uh, the trainer. It was always 56. Uh, but other ones, it would just be whatever the call, whatever the uh, that random that, that random code they would give you and uh, call sign. Okay. And we only would. Uh, Use, it, use that if we were talking to somebody, and generally we weren't talking to anybody, but we had a call So now you join up the tanker, and how did you find the tanker? Uh, he was at a spe specified route that we knew we were going to, and the navigator in the back seat would be navigating to you to the tanker. Okay, and, now. and the tanker, he would start DFing the tanker on a, uh, a DF <coughs> direction, finder. direction finder, but we also had uh, DME on it. Ah. And uh, so the the tanker would start a turn. Distance measuring equipment. Right, distance measuring equipment. But uh, based on our, our approach and the distance, and we were holding a steady speed, then the tanker navigator would normally start a turn, and uh, so he would roll out just in front of us as we're coming in. So you're just going straight the whole time, and then he pretty, he's almost joining you, in yeah, other words. Yeah, he's, he's in a racetrack pattern at some specified area waiting for us. Now, you got the KC-135s, and you got the KC-10s, and which one was easier to refuel off of? The KC-10s were easier to refuel off of because they could fly faster speeds. The uh, KC-135s were uh, at about, because of the weight with the fuel for their own aircraft and for the SR-71, they were doing about 200 and, or, uh, no, 325 knots indicated. And that was really slow for the SR when we'd pull up behind them. As they offloaded fuel, they would accelerate to their maximum speed at 25,000 feet, which was 355 knots uh, indicated. So it's only a 30 knot difference, but it would help make a difference for us. But sometimes it, that was even too slow, depending on temperatures, and you'd have to light one afterburner. And that, that could be a little tricky because um, they don't light right away, and you have to anticipate as it kicks in pulling back the other throttle. Now you have asymmetric thrust. And so you're using the, the rudders to control your uh, longitudinal, I guess, or lateral displacement. So, but there were some points where the, where the KC-135 would have to kind of put the nose down and accelerate a little bit to do a little porpoise type thing to keep to, his speed up. Yeah, to keep his speed up. He would sometimes. Okay, so now you're off the tanker. And now what? You're going to go, you're, let's say you're on an operational mission. Now what? Let's not talk about where you're going. You're just going to go. What okay. do you do? Okay, once we were off the tanker and cleared the tanker, uh, just as a note, we had no weather radar, so if there was weather ahead, uh, when we hooked up with the tanker, we could talk to them uh, via an intercom through the uh, boom. And uh, the navigator in the SR-71 would generally ask the navigator on the tanker, you know, what weather, are you painting any weather or thunderstorms out ahead? Because we're going so many, whatever the heading was. We're, we're going to be on such and such heading. And he would give them a quick brief if there was any weather. So anyhow, 
we would come off the tanker, we would uh, light the afterburners, accelerate to 0 0.99 Mach, uh, point, about 0.92 to 3, and we'd start a climb, and we'd climb up to about 28,000 feet, and while still climbing, we're in minimum afterburner, we would select maximum afterburner and start a slow pushover, trying not to go above 35,000 feet, and the aircraft would accelerate through 0 0.9, 0.95 Mach, which is the transonic uh, highest drag, and we would push the nose over to go through that as quick as we could to accelerate through the Mach number where we're going Mach 1 point something. Uh, and as soon as we started going downhill, we would start watching the keys increase, and we'd go downhill anticipating 450 keys, and by anticipating, if we're going through about 410 or 420 and it's going pretty fast, we'd start to pull back on the stick to start a climb. Uh, so that we would control the keys with pitch, hand flying it. And uh, then we'd start our climb and we'd hold 450 keys on the climb and the aircraft would just start accelerating through the Mach numbers. Uh, at about Mach 2 point, no, no wait, I'm sorry, 1.6 to 1.8, the inlets started, what they say started. They would unlock and start to move aft. Um, and uh, as we continue- You're talking about the spike in the front. The spike. Uh, and the nacelle is round and the spike is inside it and it's sort of like a donut. And as we start to accelerate above uh, 1.6, 1 1.8, the, the spike starts to move aft. So this circle here, or donut, the throat or hole gets bigger and bigger, which means more air is coming in. And uh, the air is not necessarily for the engine, it's to go around the nacelle and also for cooling. And the air... That's what those big tubes are on the side of the engine. Right, the big tubes on the side of the engine. It's a turbo bleed bypass engine. Just, I, I, I won't put this on the video, but when they, they talk about using... The pilot actually controlled the spike, too, correct? You could manually. And then there was also some doors in the back. What did the doors in the back do? You had forward and aft doors. The forward doors were automatic. You had no... Con well, you could automatically over... You could override the automatic. Well, you could override the spikes and the forward doors automatically and set a position on both of them, the spikes and the doors. The aft doors were manual. They didn't work operation or um, automatically. The aft doors um, would be set when you started this at uh, B, which was the most open point, okay? And as you went through certain mocks and you would watch the uh, spikes coming back and the compressor uh, inlet temperature and the com CIP compressor inlet pressure, um, you would go from B to A to uh, eventually about Mach 3.0, you would usually be closing the aft doors manually. Oh, you were busy. You, oh, you were very busy. And you're transferring fuel because you're controlling the CG. When you went, uh, excuse me, when you went supersonic, the CG shifted aft and you didn't want it to go any further aft than 25%. So you had to watch the C, we had a CG gauge that was about this big. So you could read the numbers real well. And you would start transferring. Well, you weren't as old then either, huh? remember? You weren't, what? <laughs> you weren't as old then. I you wasn't as old. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't need glasses to read. Uh, and you would transfer fuel towards the forward tanks to keep the CG forward to 25%. There was something about that I heard about uh, the tanks, the number of tanks. Most of the, tank, the tanks are in the fuselage, right? Right. Uh, yeah. Tanks, uh, I think it's, is it six and five or just five, were in a... In, uh, in, in bore, in par, inward part of the wing or whatever you call it. But those were the ones where they would leak the most because the poly polymer plastic or whatever would be the hottest. Right. And that's because of lack of fuel, the longest. Right, exactly. And so that, and the leaking was caused by the stuff basically melting over a period of it time. It would disintegrate or whatever you want to And also it. in the windshield too, right? Uh, no, the laminate on the windshield from heat would uh, start to ooze and it would cause uh, cloudiness. Uh, it was a V-shaped window like right, the yeah. uh, F-102, F-106 aircraft. Right. And uh, so you're looking through this, this V that comes together when you're behind the tanker and part of it when you're landing. And it would cause the, the lamination between the plies of the window to turn uh, milky from the heat. Right. right. We, we refueled right after takeoff on that mission. Then we uh, went up to speed and altitude and we came down over Hudson Bay up in Canada. We took another uh, refueling. That was our second refueling. Uh, and then our third refueling was off uh, Iceland. And then we went into uh, Norway and refueled off Bodo, Norway. Went into the Barents and came out uh, with the take. And we had enough fuel 
to uh, make it to uh, back to Mildenhall, but it was planned for a token offload. We'd come back down over Bodo, we'd decelerate and come down and uh, take like another 20,000 pounds just in case there was weather or problems at Mildenhall. What, what, what was the, how much fuel were you using per hour? <laughs> I mean, it's when you when you took off your fuel on takeoff, your fuel gauges are probably reading about 120,000 pounds per hour per engine, uh, and uh, when you uh, got up to uh, cruise, uh, when you first leveled off, say at 75,000 feet, I'm trying to remember, you're probably uh, burning about uh, 28,000 pounds, 26,000 pounds an hour per engine, and by the time you started your descent. Uh, you were down to 17,000 pounds, or some smaller, a lot smaller number. Okay, so now you're going to hit the, you're going to hit a tanker. How far ahead do you have to put the, pull the power back, put the nose down to hit the tanker? Roughly, it took about, it was about 360 nautical miles. Wow, and the nav is calling all this. Yeah, well, he's doing it. We had a moving map display in the front cockpit. It was a cam, uh, a screen about this big, it was between your legs, just just above where the surface limiter was and it was synchronized to your speed and um, it was like a movie projector and by that I mean the mission planners who plan can missions or if it was a new mission and they had to get the maps and draw it out they would draw the line and all the information that goes on the line where you should be at this altitude and speed on the line etc and they would actually take a movie of it with like a, a movie camera 16 millimeter movie camera or something wow and then they would load that film in the projector in the front seat. And it was, as I said, it was synchronized to the air, aircraft speed and you could be following around and it had information. The navigator had a thing that folded down like this and it was a rear projected thing that uh, projected onto his screen too. And he could use a grease pencil and make notes and stuff and so forth. Okay. So, uh, so it would be a point on his screen and on my screen, I would see it. And he would say, uh, okay, we're coming up on descent point. And at descent point, you take both throttles after, after, out of afterburner. You would feel a slight bump as they came out of afterburner, but the speed wouldn't change. It would take it a while. You just hold your level speed until the speed started to decrease, and then you'd start a descent. So you start the descent after the after the speed slowed down. Right. So at at, at point nine uh, point nine two or oh no 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 you're still going supersonic. You're bleeding off the speed. Uh, as you're coming down supersonic and you're decelerating, going through the Mach numbers. Well, how far down. you must be, if the, the tanker's going 325 and Mach is probably 550 at that altitude, so it, you have to be subsonic by the time you're within five miles or 10 miles or something like that, right? Right, right. Wow. It was a. Uh, but did you, ha you had, did you have air to air radar? No, no air to air radar. There was a radar at all? Uh, just, no, just to take pictures radar. Oh boy. Now my understanding is the uh, A-12s, uh, the CIA single seat, single airplane version, had a uh, weather radar. Well, I think it's the cool stuff they could have today. Okay, so now you've hit the, we talked about that. Now you're going back and you're going to go into land. How do you get ready to land? De descent checklist, basically. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, you just like any other aircraft you come into the traffic pattern i mean once you've come down supersonic and everything uh and uh, you're descending you set up just to fly like an ils approach uh you'd hit a point out there from beale say at uh, 40 miles or something was there a possibility you'd ever come down too fast would that cause problems airplane would overheat or anything like that or um the only way coming down too fast could screw things up was uh, for refueling uh and also for fuel wise uh, you know that you would have to burn more fuel at a lower altitude. Okay, so you fly your ILS approach. What is and you're at your normal fuel rate. So what's your landing speed, touchdown speed? Your approach speed was 175 knots uh, at a basic uh, weight with 10,000 pounds of fuel on board. Okay. And obviously, if you had more fuel, you would add a knot for every thousand pounds of fuel. Did you ever have to go around? Uh, normally, we never had to go around. Uh, and your touchdown. Once you uh, put the gear down and you uh, retarded the throttles. To land, uh, your touchdown speed was 150 to 155 knots. And drag shoot. Drag shoot. You had a drag One, shoot. Two. You would deploy. It was about a two, weighed about 200 pounds. I think it was like a 30 plus square, uh, 30 plus feet canopy, uh, and you would feel it coming out. I mean, uh, the flight handbook said when the drag shoot handle was up on the left dash part of the dashboard, 
and the flight manual says when you deploy, pull the handle to deploy the drag chute, take your hand away from the handle because they didn't want you when it came out. You'd go forward to push it back in because that's how you jettisoned it. Oh, wow. Wow. Huh. Yeah, and in the F4, you could really feel it. Boom. Yeah. Except the one time I didn't feel it because it came off. <laughs> I, I diverted uh, one time in the United States, and uh, uh, I'm not, I don't really remember which uh, airport we went into, but um, I deployed the drag chute, and the supervisor of flying at that military base uh, was out in his truck. And uh, I said, uh, I called him as I was rolling out, and uh, he, no, actually, he called me and he said, Do you want to jettison your chute? And I said, uh, You want me to pull off the runway and jettison it? It's heavy. And he said, Nah, just jettison it on the runway. So I jettisoned it on the runway and taxied off the runway. And uh, we didn't see the guy for another 15 or 20 minutes till he finally pulled over to the hangar they taxied us into. And he said, how much does that darn thing weigh? He said, it took me forever to get it into the back of my truck. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we're back down on the ground. You debrief, and that pretty well solved. Let's talk about some emergency procedure. Uh, the biggest thing that could go wrong was the famous unstart, correct? Right, like a compressor stall. What did that feel like? The, the flight handbook was pretty accurate in the fact it said that uh, to tell which engine, engine unstarted first, depending on your speed regime, above Mach 2.1, they uh, referred to a cross tie of the uh, inlets. And what that was is if one inlet unstarted, the other would have a sympathetic unstart within a tenth of a second. So if you were above Mach 2.1 and had an unstart, uh, generally speaking below that Mach, it was very unusual to have unstarts. But uh, if you were where the in inlets were cross-tied and you had an unstart, the uh, flight handbook said that it's the inlet that unstarted first is the one opposite your head hits the canopy. And I know of uh, a mission out of uh, Mildenhall one time uh, where a crew landed and the uh, back seater got out of the airplane and was really pissed at the front seater and his his uh, uh, visor that comes down over the face plate, a, a, uh, like sunglasses, you know, uh, co dark co coated colored thing, was broken in about three or four pieces he had it in his hand. Because uh, as we found out later, uh, they were having some problems and the uh, front seater decided he was going to try to run the inlets as tight as he could and continue the mission and the back seater was telling him, we don't have enough fuel to do that. And he says, well, let's just see what we can get. And manually he caused a horrendous unstart and the back seater hit his head against the side of the windscreen and busted his visor. <laughs> well, you, you must have had several unstarts, right? I have, yeah. Did you have a mission where you had many, many and you had to divert? Well, uh, I had a mission where I returned to uh, Okinawa um, because they, had, they would schedule the uh, uh, inlets based on the latest data they had with, with regard to weather and temperatures at altitude. Then they would schedule the inlets and the uh, forward bypass doors uh, and <clears throat> they would feed that tape into the inlets and the inlets would run automatically. We had manual controls to override them if we had to. And they had put the wrong schedule in and it was a it was a in the black mission that I took off and didn't talk to anybody and I couldn't figure out what was going on why it kept on starting and everything looked like it should look and I had about five or six unstarts till I finally gave up and said, okay, I'm done, I'm going back. So we went back and we landed. And uh, when we went into debrief and I started telling uh, maintenance people what happened, the uh, maintenance officer that was there said, uh, he said, you're a glutton for punishment. And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, they, by accident, they put the wrong schedule in for the inlets. We knew you'd be coming back. We didn't <laughs> think you'd put up with five or six unstarts. <laughs> So were those all at high speed at Mach 3 or whatever? They were in one of the worst points, like about Mach 2.3 or 2.4 at about 50 to 60,000 feet. But basically the whole airplane just goes sideways all of a sudden. Well, it tries to turn sideways, yeah. Wow, wow. Okay, we've been talking now for 44... About 4,000 feet of runway. 4,000. And it took about 5,000 feet to land with a drag chute. But when it took off, it just went... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Straight up. Yeah. We had, a, we had a mission we flew out of uh, Okinawa that um, you took off with half a fuel load instead of just a quarter. Mm -hmm. And you would take off, put the gear up, push the nose over, and you'd hit 450 knots 
at the uh, end of the runway at Okinawa, and you just start climbing at 450 till you started going supersonic, and the Keys bleed starts at 2.6 2 Mach, and you'd go right on up, level off at about 77,000 feet, and different guys had, you know, would fly that mission, and everybody tried to see how quick they could do it, and I believe the record from releasing the brakes to leveling off at 77,000 feet in about Mach 3.0, one guy held, it was about 13 minutes, I think. Jesus. 13, 14 minutes. Well, you told me once before about the time when you would have to fly every three days in Okinawa, and the mobile crew would be sitting on the ground, and the way you would indicate you were back is you would squirt some fuel out. We would. Tell, we the, would, tell we the story would, again. I think it's just great. We'd come back in on a, on a training sortie. We'd have to fly, it, you'd have to fly every three days when you were TDY, and if they didn't have an operational mission come in from uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff, JCS, um, they would fly a training sortie, which basically uh, took off and, and hit a tanker and just took a partial fuel load, went up to speed and altitude, went around the island twice, the island of Okinawa, and then descended and landed. And so anyhow, when we flew those, the mobile crew would be on the ground, uh, and we would, when we were making our, our loop around the island, we would call them on the radio and tell them, uh, okay, we're coming by, and we'd tell them where we were, so they would look in that direction, and we'd dump fuel. We'd say, okay, we're going to squirt now. We'd turn the fuel dump on for like, you know, 1,001, 1,002, turn it off, and then, you know, wait maybe 1,001, 1,002, turn it back on, you know, 1,001, 1,000, turn it off. We'd do that three or four times. And until you were the mobile crew and saw it, you couldn't believe it because, like, you're looking up in the sky, and here's a squirt of fuel here, and it's only two seconds, and then, gosh, it's way over here, boom, and then you're almost halfway around the island. <laughs> And so when you do that, it's just an ignition? It, big no, it's, it looks like uh, airline, uh, airliners that have a contrail. Oh, okay. It looked like white smoke, right, right. but it's actually the fuel vaporizing in the air. Okay. How come the airplane didn't con at altitude? Because uh, we were above the, uh, what is the uh, moisture level? But, and didn't they put something? Part of the, uh, in the front seat there was a periscope. After you close the front seat cabin, you push a periscope to look behind you. And uh, mainly it was used for trimming the rudders. But also, uh, we were supposed to report the start and stop of the contrails. And um, well, tell us about the time you uh, lost an engine and you had to look back through the periscope. Yeah, I was on a functional check flight. I had had a double engine change, and this was in Okinawa. And uh, I, ha I had an unstart at speed at about 75, 77,000 feet. We were doing about Mach 3.2, maybe. And the engine unstarted and the firelight came on, the engine on the right side. The other one was sympathetic, boom. And I looked in the periscope and, uh, and I told the back seater, I said, we've, we, we've got a firelight. You know, with the unstart, we've got a firelight. And I said, and I see smoke behind us. We're too high. We're not kind of, we've got to be on fire. So I, I said, I'm going through the emergency shutdown procedure for uh, engine fire, which I started doing. And we're still <clears throat> talking to each other. And he's following me up with checklists. You know, just saying, did you do step one, two, three, four, five? And then the other steps he has to read to me. You didn't have to memorize them. And we're starting a descent. And uh, they talk about in the flight handbook about a single engine supersonic de descent. The aircraft starts to pitch and roll violently. It's very hard to control. And uh, they said it's po and the flight handbook says it's possible for the operating engine to flame out. So we're pitching and rolling, and it's pretty violent. And the guy I flew with uh, was probably about 6'4", six, 6'5", six, and he, he's, he's in the back seat trying to steady himself. And on the side, rail, side panels here are some of his radio controls on the right side and the intercom switches. And they were just little pull-up ones that you turn to the volume. And he pushed everything off. He turned off all the radios by accident. So he couldn't hear me, and I couldn't hear him, and I'm calling for checklists, and he's not talking to me. I don't know what's going on. So I am start running the rest of the checklist by myself to follow up on the sh shutdown of the right engine. And about then, um, the uh, good generator that's operating trips off, and I say, uh-oh, something's really going on here. I told him the, the left generator quit, and I'm checking the engine to see uh, if it's running. And about then, the pressure suit starts to inflate, and there's a pull-down strap here, because the pressure suit, if you didn't have the pull-down the strap, it could come up right over your face like this. So I'm pulling down the pull-down strap, flying the airplane, trying to check the good engine to see if it's running or not. Because I've got RPM, but we're coming down, falling like a rock, even though we're pitching and moving like this. And uh, because the suit started to inflate and the generator went off, the only thing it can be is the engine's not running. So I jammed the throttle into afterburner 
and uh, I see the EGT go boom like that, and it starts running, the suit starts deflating. I recycle the good generator, and it comes back online. And we're through about, uh, we started about 77,000 feet. We're probably through about 50, maybe 55,000 feet, or maybe somewhere near. And uh, he had figured out what had happened in the back seat. And I hear this sheepish voice. He says, are you still there? <laughs> and I said, where you been? <laughs> And uh, he said, I thought you might have ejected. Because <laughs> you can't see between the cockpits. Even though there is a light that's supposed to come on that says front seat ejected, which never came on. Uh, and I said, what happened to you? And he said, I actually turned off, I accidentally turned off the radio. And I said, what? And he said, we'll talk about it later. <laughs> he said, what checklist and where are we? So uh, because of the uh, uh, fuel and the weight we had as we started down, I started to try to level off once we got subsonic at about 20, 25,000 feet or so, and the airplane started to stall on me single engine. And uh, I flipping through my checklist, uh, there's a page that shows single engine uh, altitude uh, for different weights, and I'm looking at what my weight is, figuring it out, and I look down here and it's 11,000 feet, and I thought, wow, that's pretty low. <laughs> so I descended down to 11,000 feet and was able to level off at about 11,000 feet. And um, he has the same checklist because he said, why are we so low? And I said, check, look at your checklist. This is it for our weight. And I said, I said, where's uh, Okinawa? And he said, I don't know. <laughs> I said, give me a heading. And I said, and while you're at it, resync the navigation because all my headings are off from my whiskey compass. I was just flying the whiskey compass, keeping the wings as level as I could. And he resynced the nav, which was good. And I had my platforms and the heading swung around. He resynced the heading. And uh, the maintenance people in Okinawa <clears throat> would keep an HF radio for the DF on for us when we were coming back, because we could uh, DF off of them if we wanted to. We called them Mama. And he said, I'm gonna see if I can get a DF on Mama. And he tried a couple times till finally the DF needle pointed real close to the heading we were on. We were just had guessed. And he said, okay, that's, that's Mama, fly that heading back to Okinawa. Then when we got close enough, we called, told him we had a, uh, single engine, we'd lost an engine, and so forth. I remember a long time ago, uh, <clears throat> we got together, and I think I had just gotten back from Okinawa flying in a C-130, and uh, I think we flew from Okinawa up to Tokyo, from Tokyo up to uh, Elmendorf in Alaska. Basically, it was a 16-hour flight or 18-hour flight, and took two days plus a night. And then you told me about the mission, or that, that I think at that time you held the squadron record from returning from Okinawa to Beal. Why don't you tell us how you did it? It was called, uh, they had a code name for it. It's called Glowing Heat at one time. We would uh, swap out airplanes between Beal and Okinawa. We would do the same thing for Milton Hall at certain times when aircraft had to have heavy maintenance. Um, at some point later on in the program, they decided, uh, you know, if we're going to swap out airplanes, why don't we fly a mission swapping them out, which they did. So you couldn't get any real records after that. But I flew from Okinawa back to Beale Air Force Base, which is sort of the equivalent of flying from, say, Tokyo to San Francisco, in a sense. And um, I did it from break release to touchdown at Beale in, I think it was just barely under four hours. It might have been exactly four hours. And uh, it was uh, <coughs> just uh, two refuelings. One refueling right after takeoff, one refueling off the Aleutian Islands up in Alaska. That's fast. That, is, glow fast. that is glowing heat. <coughs> okay. They, I, they I, had a double glowing heat one time <coughs> where the two pilots said they saw each other. Uh, in other words, one was coming home and one was going over. And uh, the, uh, <coughs> they were at different altitudes, but because the uh, navigation system was so accurate, it was an astro inertial that tracked the stars, they, you know, passed, one passed right over the top of the other. And they were counting down. They knew, you know, they were DFing each other. <laughs> And so the one guy's looking, the guy on the bottom looking up, he said the airplane was uh, looked gray. It didn't look black when it went by. Wow. Which was interesting. But think of the closure rate. It had to be 60 to 70 miles a minute. Oh, yeah. I mean, you wouldn't have much time to spot anything. No, no, no. It was quick. Oh, yeah. The guy said it was really, you know, they started looking like 100 miles out. And he, trying to, the guy who was lower tried, started looking at 100 miles out. Yeah. The guy that was higher said he had no, no chance because he's got to look over the chine over the nose. Yeah. So he'd mm -hmm. never see him, he said. Uh, just over seven and a half hours. 
we took off out of Beale, went up uh, through Alaska. We went over from Alaska. We went down the Kamchatka Peninsula by Russia. We came in off the uh, northern island of Japan, Hokkaido, I think it is. We dropped down, refueled, and then from Hokkaido we went over and we did a, a couple passes through uh, Korea, through the DMZ, and then we came back out uh, and refueled somewhere else and then went back to, uh, and landed in Okinawa. That whole mission was about seven and a, almost seven and a half hours. So was that refueling like three times? No, let's see, one, two, three, four, four refuelings. As long as we're at it, what the hell? What, tell us about the time you got shot at. Uh, that was in August of 1981. It was the first operational sortie that I flew with a new RSO or navigator. And uh, <clears throat> it was our last, we were, it was a six week TDY and it was our last sortie for the six weeks. We were going home the next day, scheduled to go home, which we did. But anyhow, they had been flying this uh, sortie through the DMZ and there's an island in the DMZ called Choctari, I think it was the name of it. And uh, when we would fly that, we were getting uh, indications of a SAM radar site on Choctari. And uh, so guys would report it and in, in debrief to the intelligence officer and they were keeping data, data of it. And uh, it was pretty regular. And uh, anyhow, uh, when we flew the, in our mission in the pre-briefing before we went, uh, I asked the intelligence officer, I said, we've gotten all this data from, you know, other sorties for the last, it was for the last almost 10 weeks, that there's probably a site there. I said, why do they call it a suspected SAM site? And the guy says, oh, you know, I, you know somebody higher up than me makes those decisions. I have no idea. And I said, what, what do you need, a visual or something? He said, that would help. I was just joking around. So anyhow, on that sortie, you made three or four, I think you made one, one, two, you made three passes through the DMZ. And uh, the first two passes we had nothing. The last passes were coming through actually heading from east to west towards the South China Sea, I guess it was. Uh, my back seater says, uh, uh, I've got a missile site up. He said, they're uh, painting us. They've gone to uh, high PRF, which is pulse recurrence frequency where they can uh, narrow down their beam width so it's stronger on a target, in other words, like a lock-on. Instead of just sweeping, bang, you know, now they're just looking at one thing. Uh, they have high PRF, and the SAM site had the capability to simulate launching a missile. And he said uh, they've launched a missile, and then they could talk to the missile to guide it. He said they're talking to the missile, and uh, one of the things that made the SR special was we had the capability to know if the missile answered. Other airplanes didn't, so we would know if it was a spoof or not. So he said, they're talking to the missile, and then he says, oh my God, the missile answered. <laughs> and I'm looking out over the nose of the airplane and I see the damn thing coming up. I said, I got a visual. <laughs> and so we had a procedure. He said, accelerate, accelerate, because anything you do to change the equation, because it's a head-on pass, in this instance, there was, I believe, it's like a 52-second window from the time he acquires us to be able to lock on, track us, fire a missile, and he might have 10 seconds of guidance and hit us before, you know, because the closure rate's so fast. The missile is doing uh, Mach 2 point something or Mach 3, and we're doing Mach 3, so you got, you know, a hypersonic close, closure rate. I saw it go by the airplane, and it's hard to estimate distance at altitude. I saw it explode. And uh, so anyhow, we, I jammed the throttles forward, uh, we accelerated up to about 3.3, 3.4, I don't know what we were doing, and we started to turn to another parameter in the equation. So as soon as we came off track, because we started this turn, all our missions were monitored, and whoever does the monitoring, they would tell somebody else, and they would transmit over uh, HF frequency, and it was all um, alpha phonetic codes, and the guy in the back seat had the code book. And they would say, Sky King, Sky King, Sky King. And they would say this first code, which might be Juliet Hotel Mike. And that was SR-71, say, for that day. And so he knows they're talking to him. And then they'd start sending out these codes, and it's saying, you're off track. <laughs> Basically, you're off track. So we were supposed to be making a turn and go back to Okinawa anyhow. So we just had turned a little early, and we're headed back to Okinawa. And when we land, uh, nobody knows what's going on because 
he looks through his code book and there's nothing to say visual sighting of a missile fired. He doesn't have any, you know, alpha codes to tell him, alpha phon phonetic codes or whatever. So when we land and we get out of the airplane and we go down the ladder, the squadron, the commander of the detachment would always meet you at the bottom of the ladder. And he said, he whispers to me, because there's all kinds of people standing around, everything's hush hush, and he thinks maybe we screwed up. He said, did you have any airplane problems? We said, no airplane problems. He said, do you know you guys went off track? And I said, a missile, we saw a SA-2 fi firing. He said, you saw a missile? I said, yes, sir. He said, shh, he said, everybody inside. You saw a missile. That's the only time you ever been fired at. That I was fired at yeah. in the SR? That's the only time I saw one. But uh, there were other times they discovered that a lot of guys had been fired at and never saw them. Yeah. Well, that was a big deal. I mean, that, oh, it was a big deal. That was huge. We deal. landed. Um, Reagan was president. And he raised hell. Right? Reagan was president. Yeah. And uh, uh, I'm trying to think what happened. They notified when when all the communications started working because uh, when we're going through debrief, the commander of the detachment asks his NCO comm officer, the NCO. He says. What are we supposed to do? And the guy's looking through this book, and he says, you have to call the president or the White House or somebody. So he calls the White House and tells them what happened. And then, shit, it was, before we left the squadron that night, it was on CNN. But uh, the, uh, I can't think of what was it, the wing over there, 15th TAC fighter wing in Okinawa? I don't know what the fighter wing was. And they had F-15s, and they were notified through the chain, you know, to an alerted to go to an alert status for a deployment to Korea, the whole four squadrons. They had some airplanes over there because they were thinking we might be going to war. You know, there was a live missile firing at an airplane and blah, 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 blah. So the uh, director of operations of the 15th Air Force, this colonel, I was a major at the time, he wanted to come over to the detachment to talk to the pilot that said he saw the, the firing. Well, it turns out this colonel that comes over he was a major when I was a captain at Nellis in the fighter weapons school, and he knew me, and we'd flown together. He was coming over to make sure it was a credible source. So he, when he came over to uh, our detachment, and they let him in because it's a secure area, and he says, who was the pilot? And he walks in, and they said it was uh, Major Rosenberg, and he looks at me and says, Rosie. And I said, uh, I didn't know he was there. I didn't know he was a DO. And uh, uh, Moody Souter was his name. I said, Colonel Souter. And he says, you saw the fire? And I said, yes, sir. He says, good enough for me. Let's go. We're deploying. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they launched about 16 F-15s, uh, I think. <laughs> All because of little old Maury. <laughs> yeah, my fault. I think that's enough. Okay, that's more than enough. <laughs>